Indianapolis Motor Speedway, the legendary Temple of Speed. But this weekend, it's home to the 58th running of the SCCA National Championship runoffs. Over 900 drivers coming here to ply their trade in a winner-take-all finale, but only 26 will kiss the bricks. Welcome to a rainy Indianapolis Motor Speedway on Haggerty Race Day. As the skies have opened up, and as you can see, we have a very wet racetrack as the rain continues to fall. I'm John Phippen, so happy to be here with you as we're about to get our GT2 National Final underway. Alongside me, Larry Lefty McLeod. Larry, you've uh, had a little experience in the rain. I've done a little bit in the rain, and uh, I can tell you, my, my experience has been in open wheel stuff in the rain. I've done a little bit of things here in the uh, the rain in closed tin tops, and that we're going to see a lot of tin tops, a couple open wheel, open top in this, uh, this category here in GT2. And this class is true known for its horsepower. These are our big motor cars in this GT2 category. I don't know how much horsepower is going to be helping you today with these conditions. Exactly right. With it this wet, it certainly is going to lean toward, and you can see the Porsches down there. There's a half a dozen Porsches in the field. They're certainly going to have an advantage, I think, with that rear engine configuration. But we've got uh, our friends at Mazda doing the sponsorship of our broadcast, and we thank them so much for that. And uh, they also sponsored the track map. So, uh, Larry, take us around this 2.6-mile circuit. Sure. We're going to come down that front straight off that green flag, and there's going to probably be about four cars wide, and with this water spray, is going to be about 10 stories of rain scattering through the air as they're going to funnel down through turns one and two. Maybe start to sort things out by the time we get through turns three and four. We'll get to that carousel at six, which leads you then through six, eight along that back straight. Another opportunity for the cars to fan out. We'll see water spraying everywhere. They'll make a left turn onto the S's for seven, eight, nine, and 10. Off 10, critical turn there to get a run up back onto the banking there at uh, oval turn two. They'll make that run down at a 12, come down off the banking now there, make the 12, 13 complex, late apex at 13, so critical around here as that'll lead you through the 14 and then flat out down that front straight again. I think, tell you what, some of the stuff, a lot of these drivers haven't seen this track in the wet. They're going to see it that way today. Yeah, there was some rain early in the week uh, for some testing, but uh, all of the qualifying days, bright sunshine, cool temperatures. This will be the first time some of these drivers have experienced this track under wet flag conditions. Remember, Mazda does a lot more than present the track map here at the runoffs. They support their drivers with face-to-face -face and virtual coaching at events throughout the year. So as you can see the umbrellas down there on pit lane, you can see uh, Tom Patton's open cockpit Sunbeam Tiger. There are a couple Tigers in this field, uh, which uh, should be a little interesting for them as they'll have to uh, keep those visors clear. But uh, down there amongst them is the third member of our broadcast team, Hayward Wagner. And uh, Hayward, if you're ready, uh, let's talk about rain tires. Rain tires is a part of this story, so is visibility. We just got the three-minute board here. Andrew Alcalanta, your poles are just rolled into grid maybe 30 seconds ago, waiting till the absolute last minute. I just did a quick walk up and down the line to just kind of check in with everybody. Uh, Tiger Tom Patton, as you mentioned, not real happy about driving in the rain in that wide open car. Somebody who is real happy is Scotty White. He's back about 10, 11 on the grid. He's from the Pacific Northwest, races in the rain quite a bit, is very, very comfortable with these conditions. The biggest smile right now is Mark Bowden. He gave me two big, enthusiastic thumbs up. He's got all buckled up in the car, buttoned up. They've got the windows up. So I didn't get a chance to talk to him, but uh, he is very, very pleased with these conditions in the rear drive Porsche. One thing to keep an eye on as we go through the rest of today, I had a good talk with Bruce Voss from Hoosier. He says that until there is an absolute, it is dry line, wets are going to be the way to go. So we don't think we're going to see a changing condition in this race, but keep an eye out for the line drying as we go. Yeah, the weather forecast, unfortunately, for the rest of the weekend is uh, is pretty glum as it looks like rain uh, may be intensifying over the uh, the course of the afternoon and through the early part of the day tomorrow. If we have dry track, I'm guessing late tomorrow afternoon might be the earliest. It might be. So I think we are going to have pretty consistent conditions throughout this race, maybe a little bit heavier, a little lighter rain, but I think it's going to continue to rain through this field. Uh, but good comment there about Mark Bowden. Uh, obviously an experienced driver there, a couple time champion, and in the engine over the wheels seems to be a pretty good configuration in the rain to just be able to plant that thing and come out of corners. Uh, and he's not wrong about Scotty White. You can see there, his, uh, that's his Viper there, the big Scotty B on the side of it. Pacific Northwest, is it ever not rain in the Pacific Northwest? So <laughs> exactly. that guy may have the most experience in this field in the wet. He's gonna be starting back in 13th, but don't count him out. And our pole sitter, 
Well, he drives that thing sideways half the time anyway, so how much different will that be in the wet? We'll about, about to find out. That car has won this class the last two times running in 2019 and 2020, but he's gonna have a fight on his hands with all that torque from that Corvette motor. Uh, trying to pull off the corners, knowing he's got a couple of Porsches just a, a row behind him there with uh, the number four, 144 of Tim Kasman as well as Mark Bowden we talked about. Let's introduce the 22 car starting grid. Andrew Aqualani, the only driver to eclipse his own lap record set here four years ago in 2017. He qualified at a 139.665 in the Phoenix Performance Corvette. Andrew is a 10-time national champion and defending uh, champion of this class. He is sports car's pick to finish atop the podium, but I don't think sports car fa factored the rain in. Starting alongside him on that front row is the number 46 of Mark Bowden, a four-time champion, the defending Touring 2 national champ out of Winnetka, Illinois in the Chicago region in the fall line, Porsche 991.2. Justin Oaks will start inside of row three in car 11 out of Houston, Texas in the Droneworks Chevy Corvette. Next to him, Tim Kesman in the 144 out of Franksville, Wisconsin in the Milwaukee region. Tim is super sweep eligible, also picked by sports car to finish on the podium. I think that's a good uh, a good uh, opportunity for the Fall Line Motorsports 11s of Love Porsche to do just that. Lou Gelati back with us on the his fifth runoff start in the number 28 out of Princeton, Texas in the Texas region, the G2 Motorsports Park Corvette for him. Next to him in row three, the 51 of Jonathan Start out of Caledonia, Michigan, and the Western Michigan region in the Kalen Construction Hoosier Tire Dodge Viper. Thomas Erb is in car number six. He is inside of row four from Barrington, Illinois, and the Chicago region in another fall line Porsche. Next to him, veteran campaigner Pete Peterson in the 98 out of Lumberton, North Carolina, in the Central Carolina region, a seven-time national champion, but he hasn't been atop the podium since zero, uh, 2008 in the Peterson Toyota Toyota Celica. Tiger Tom Patton, we talked about him in the number 50 Sunbeam Tiger out of Fairfield Township, Ohio, and the Cincinnati region. He is the 99 champion of this field uh, in the Hoosier Felice Engines Carbotech sponsored Sunbeam Tiger. Joe Koenig next to him in the number 70 out of Chicago, Illinois, in the Chicago region, or Glenville, Illinois, excuse me, and the Chicago region in the Trimtex Drywall Products Fall Line BMW E46. Joe is the winner of the Hawk Breakthrough Performer Award for the driver who made up the most positions between Tuesday and Wednesday qualifying. Koenig picked up 11 spots. William Moore will start inside of row six on the 38 out of Chagrin Falls, Ohio, and the New Ohio region in his Chevy Camaro. Next to him, the 165 of Jorge Nazario out of San Juan, Puerto Rico in the Texmania Chevy Corvette. Scotty B. White, we talked about him inside of row seven in the zero out of Auburn, Washington in the Northwest region. Scotty B. is also super sweep eligible in his Hoodyear, excuse me, his Hawk Goodyear Dodge Viper. Terry, uh, Terry Gillis in the number 69 starts next to him in the uh, out of Avon Lake, Ohio, in the Neo Ohio region in the Hoosier-sponsored Nissan 350Z. Matt Gray is in row eight on the 64 car. Chaska, Minnesota, his home out of Landa Lakes uh, region. Ryan Company's Ford Mustang. Next to him, Kenny Bupp out of Fort Lauderdale, Florida, in the Florida region in the 84 car, the Bupp Motorsports Palm Express Porsche 991 GT3 Cup. Andrew Wright in the 21 and the other Sunbeam Tiger in the field. Andrews will be easy to pick out. It's got that Tiger Stripe livery out of Murfreesboro, Tennessee, in the East Tennessee Race Prep sponsored machine. Our highest placed rookie will start outside of row nine. That's the 37 of Boyd Lear out of Garden City, Kansas in the Colorado region. Skeeters and Dressel sponsor his Chevy Monte Carlo. Another a pair of rookies starts in row 10, the 34 of R. Paul Evans from Louisville, Texas, and the Texas region in the DeFord Motorsports Panos Esperante. Levi Lear in the number eight will start outside of row 10 from Sedan, Kansas in the Wichita region in the Lear Health Services Chevy Monte Carlo. On the final row, the number 60 of Timothy Gray out of Minneapolis in the Land Lakes region in another Ryan Company's Ford Mustang and the 88 of Robert Kelly from Huntington Beach, California in the Cal Club in the UPR Dodge Viper Competition Coupe. Coming out of turn 14, look at the spray already at safety car speed as our front row of Mark Bowden and Andrew Aquilante coming to the green. Green flag is away. Bowden gets a good acceleration, as you would expect. And Tim Kesman, right behind him, is going to follow him through. You can see Andrew Aquilante, that car squirming, hydroplaning, coming down the front straightaway. Same thing for Bowden, really squirrely on the brakes as he's down into turn number one. 
uh, Bowden able to take that jump with the power right over that rear axle in the Porsches and do the same thing there for Tim Kesman as they were able to jump past Aqualante. Aqualante is going to be fighting to try and get by those guys, but now they're all out there feeling where is the rain, where is it deepest, which corners do we really have to watch for? Because at a track like this, it looks mostly flat. That just means the pavement kind of leans one way or another, and these guys really don't know which way it goes. So it's time to start looking for puddles here out of the next night. Look at that slide there already for Bowden. And here comes Tim Kesman diving down to the inside. He's going to try to take over that spot. Andrew Aqualante also getting a wheel up on the curb. That tire trying to get away from him. Car control is absolutely essential here. There is so much rain, has been so much rain in the past few minutes. There's a lot of standing water here. And these cars, even though they're running rain tires, are hydroplaning through some of these puddles. Yep as it's a Porsche duel at the front. Kesman in the white 144. The 46 of Bowden on the inside. Look at that car squirrely over the puddles. Kesman is going to sweep into the lead. Bowden looking for any kind of pavement to touch the brakes on. Remember in fall line world, these guys are both fall line cars. Mark Bowden is the boss at fall line, but Kesman, now the customer there, is out in front of this field as Bowden and his rival Aquilante appropriately named Aqua, <laughs> anything, <laughs> water here, Aqualante. I like it. Going to continue to fight in that Corvette. Again, look at him, looking for any kind of that darker pavement. You see shiny pavement, that's going to be a little deeper water. When you're looking for dark pavement, as you can see, a little bit of a higher line there for Aqualante, trying to get outside, knowing that the banking is high, the water won't be there. Aqualante, I don't think, was uh, choosing that high line. I think that he was chasing that car up to the barrier as it was stepping out on him as the uh, rain tires doing their best to try to wash this water away. But these top three doing a great job. You know, we were all quick to write off Andrew Aqualante's chances in that powerful Phoenix Corvette, uh, but he is obviously doing a fantastic job staying right with these Porsches that are a little better suited to these conditions. Obviously, these guys are fantastic drivers, well set up cars, but they also have an important thing in the rain. That is windshield wipers. Not all the cars in this field have those. Uh, I suspect further back in the TA2 cars probably do not have those. But these guys up front, certainly as the GT3 Cup Porsche cars do, and Mantra's car, which is not that far off, kind of a touring trim, and that thing still has the wipers. You can see them working there. That's a huge deal of this kind of visibility in these conditions when you're trying to fight with somebody. If you don't have them, you're going to probably be tendency to drag back just a little bit just for visibility and wait for the battle in front of you to sort of check themselves up. But you see the gap already from these guys. It's about 15 seconds back. Uh, it was John at the start and his Viper coming across the line third. Look at the veteran Lou Gelati up there now into fifth. So we'll kind of keep our eye on him hanging on to that. But this battle up in front with Kesman looking solid right now, looking for that rain line, trying to stay off the oil and the rubber down along those apexes. Yeah, that's one thing you'll notice is that the uh, cars and drivers are not taking the customary racing line. They will be looking for places where the rubber and the oil are not on the racetrack. So you'll see them well off the uh, normal apex because that's where the grip is under these wet conditions. And Tim Kesman doing a perfect job. As you can see, he's a several car lengths off the apex there at turn number seven as he is hunting for the places where he's got traction and he has found it as he is able to stretch out his advantage. It was only half a second at the line, but uh, he has opened up a much bigger gap now as uh, Andrew Aquilante struggling just a little bit more under these conditions. But take nothing away from the 10-time champion. He's doing a fantastic job. And this is really a bit of a lottery. It is, would be very easy for any of these cars, no matter what they're driving, to, to uh, catch a puddle at just the wrong spot, and you could be out of this race in an instant. Yeah, I'm watching Andrew, and his hands are moving all over the place. That car, the back end does a couple inch twitch, one way the other way, and we've got the number 70 already loose. Joe Koenig. Joe in the uh, BMW, the uh, Trimtex drywall products machine. He was the driver who won the Hawk Break, uh, Breakthrough Performance Award for making up the most positions between Tuesday and Wednesday qualifying. As we'll see coming down, uh, yeah, it just he just aquaplaned coming down the Holman Strait as that car just took a sharp left-hand turn right into the barrier. He was running six at the time. You had seen Lou Gelati in the Corvette right in front of him, but yeah, I think you're right. He just sort of under braking, aquaplaned, and at that point, you're just a passenger along for the ride. Absolutely, so that was a pretty big lick. So obviously, we're going full course yellow uh, with uh, that problem for Joe Coining, running in sixth spot at the time of that off. And this will take just a bit to clean up because that car, obviously, not a roller at this point. Yeah, it's in fact, his, uh, the Hawk brakes that he won, he may need them next. He puts the car back together because I think the brakes are gone for the left front of that car now. Yeah, exactly right. But uh, Tim Kesman now sees his big uh, f over four-second lead evaporate 
but uh, already coming up to uh, put a lap on some of the back markers who are really struggling in these conditions. Obviously, under yellow flag conditions, he can't pass any of them, so they'll be able to circ circulate around to uh, catch up to the back of the pack as there's the safety car just now picking up or hoping to pick up our leaders. There's a couple of slower cars that are going to get waved around, I would guess. I think that is one of our TA2 cars. Not sure which driver that is, but it's one of the, the, the TA2 Trans Am series cars yep. that gets slotted into this class. He does, in fact, have a wiper, you can see, on that car. Yep. It looks to be uh, a little ragged, but uh, <laughs> it's uh, it's doing something to keep uh, keep the weather off. Yeah, yeah. The other thing to think about with these guys certainly is uh, fog either if in your visor or on your windshield. They get a lot of layers, opportunities for fog to build up, and that really creates more visibility issues. Um, so, and now as they slow down, less air flowing to the car, your breath starts to fog up your visor just a little bit. So, uh, some of these guys can really look for some visibility. Uh, as Joe is out of the car right now. Yeah, that was a big hit, so it's good to yeah. see Joe out of the car and okay. Yeah. But uh, let's do a quick rundown as we are working race lap number three. Tim Kesman is your leader. Aquala Andrew Aqualante in second. Mark Bowden in third. Jonathan Start in the fourth spot. Lou Gelati, a great move, up into fifth position. Justin Oaks in sixth. Jorge Nazario in seventh. Thomas Erb in the eighth spot. William Moore rounding out the top ten. Boyd Lear, one of our rookies in the field. Doing a good job up to 11. Scotty B. White struggling just a bit in these uh, conditions. Has not yet come across the line. Tiger Tom Patton being shown in the 12th spot. Andrew Wright as those two Sunbeam Tigers lapping right next to one another. Levi Lear, last of the cars still running. Matt Gray looks like uh, had a problem on the opening lap, as did Timothy Gray. Pete Peterson, uh, Robert Kelly, Kenny Buck, Paul Evans all did not complete a lap under these conditions. That is, in fact, Timothy Gray just in front of the leaders here. Yeah, just about to come across the line, so that'll put him uh, on the lap chart. So one note I had heard is uh, mentioned about uh, Mr. Oaks there. Justin Oaks currently running in sixth. Started this race in third. Has never raced in the rain before, which may be a bit surprising coming from Houston, Texas. But uh, at this point, no, he's apparently, one reason or another, had not had the chance. As a bit of dejection there, throwing the gloves down uh, was... Joe there on that shot. But yeah, for Justin, this is his first chance to see rain. Now he's had a couple of laps, and when the field gathers back up, he'll be right on the back of them, but still wondering, how do we do this again? This is wet. Exactly. As you can see, timing and scoring has already made the determination that this will be a timed race, 40 minutes rather than the 19 laps. But while we're uh, under this full course yellow, as they're cleaning up the incident involving Joe Koenig, let's just take a break and say hello to our friends from Haggerty and Mazda. Why race? Because it's in our blood. A love of driving that pushes us as hard on the road as it does on the track. It's why we reinvented the roast and put a piece of it into every car we make. It's why we refine, rethink, and refine again. And it's why we'll always engineer to your heart's BPM. Not simply an engine's RPM. Why race? Why indeed? When the finish line calls, we answer. Hit the road with insurance protection from Haggerty. Whether you drive a built racer, sports car, or exotic, and save an average of $264. Get a quote today at Haggerty.com. Welcome to that magic realm. Between here and there. A no man's land. An everyone's land. Where great expectations grow and rewards are given to the swift, the perceptive, and the daring. Introducing the Mazda CX-30 Turbo with all-wheel drive. More power for your pursuit. Welcome back to a rainy Indianapolis Motor Speedway on Haggerty Race Day as we're running the 58th running of the SCCA National Championship runoffs. This is GT2. And that car at the front is not the leader. The Porsche right behind him is, as we are behind the safety car to clean up after an incident involving the 70 of Joe Koenig. But we've got uh, our intrepid pit reporter braving the elements. We're in a nice dry announce booth, but braving the elements is Hayward Wagner. Hayward, you've got some Mazda updates for us. Yeah, guys, well, we've got a little bit of a break here with the weather. I've got Michael Borden here. Michael, you've been running the Mazda MX-5 Cup with the new spec car. Not a lot of people in the SCCA world have gotten a chance to learn about these cars. Talk a little bit about what Mazda's doing. 
So it's kind of like an upgraded uh, spec Miata chassis. It's the third generation after those two. Um, so it's a little bit quicker. It's got a lot more horsepower. It's about 30 more horsepower. And they, it's similar rule book, so the same type of modifications done to the car, kind of with the intention of making it cost effective and reliable and easy to tech all at the same time. Um, just trying to keep the, make the cars even, so it's more of comes down to the driver than the car itself, and kind of a driver de development series. Um, they do a lot for that. There's coaching available and all kinds of other things. Uh, they're also it's a great like ladder system to get out. So. Um, tell me a little bit about the driving dynamic of this car. Is it a little bit bigger than the cars that we have in Spec Miata? Going to a Spec Series with a little bit bigger car, what, what's your drive experience been like so far? It's been really good. Um, the cars are slightly bigger, not much. Slightly longer wheelbase, a little wider, but a little heavier. But to be honest, you don't really notice it. It's got bigger tires, so it kind of evens it out. Um, I really like them. I think they're a little more balanced than the Spec Miatas. Uh, they're, they're fairly easy to drive to get a decent amount of speed out of it but to get all of it it's pretty difficult so they're a great car to learn how to drive in. Well it's a great way for folks to get involved in motorsports or move up as you were mentioned with the ladder and uh, we're excited to see these cars come out so thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks Hayward and then just another indication of just how involved Mazda is in all of our road racing series here at the SCCA uh, National Championship runoffs and uh, exciting new opportunities for the venerable Mazda MX-5 to uh, continue its uh, ability to be one of the one of the mainstays of uh, SCCA club racing. As uh, they often say, there are more Mazdas being raced on any given re weekend in North America than any other make, probably than any other make combined. Might I think, be, yeah. yeah, it's it's a whole bunch of them. As we see uh, the number eight car of Levi Lear in the Chevy Monte Carlo. One of those TA2 cars, TA2 Trans Am 2 is the support uh, race for the uh, the original Trans Am series with the big 850 horsepower ground pounders. The uh, TA2 cars fit into this GT2 category quite nicely and on a dry track would certainly be a factor, but uh, in these conditions, they definitely have a disadvantage. Yeah, that'd be a, that'd be a, a fun but difficult run to be running one of those around it in here in the wet. Exactly right. As he's actually, look at he's coming in to pit in. Yep, I think he's... Uh, either going to come in for, maybe he went out on intermediates and he's going to come in for full wets. That's a joke. But anyway, <laughs> nobody's laughing, so I guess it was only funny to me. In any event, <laughs> the safety car working its way down the Holman Strait as Tim Kesman, Andrew Aqualante, and Mark Bowden in your meddling positions right now. And just behind Bowden, Jonathan Stark doing a great job in that Dodge Viper. The Viper kind of a mid-engine car. The uh, That big V10 power plant yeah. is well behind the front axle. Yeah, so you look at that car and you think, oh, the engine's got to be right over the front wheels. It is not. It is so far back, which puts the driver almost. I've actually driven a Viper before, and you sit so far back, there's an acre of hood line out in front of you, and yep. part of that reason is to get that weight distribution a little bit further back. That's a good shot there of Jonathan in his Viper. Running in the fourth position right now, so he's certainly going to be a factor. Jonathan Stark. Western Michigan region. This is his 12th runoff start. His best finish was uh, third in 2011 at Road America in the Showroom Stock C class, one of the many classes that has since gone by the wayside here as uh, the SCCA to be congratulated, constantly updating their class structure, making uh, uh, room for just about any kind of car you can imagine. There even, there's even a working group right now for electric cars uh, to come into the SCCA. So we might see some Teslas racing before too much longer. It's probably bound to happen one day or another, so yeah, I'm glad to see that we're looking into that already. But uh, here today in this GT2 category, it's, I love the the range of cars we've got there. You can see it in the shot, not only with Aqualante and the Corvette and the two fall line Porsches up there, the Viper, but then you've got the, the TA2 Trans Am cars up into this field. And I think it's really a great mixture as they all kind of land here, and GT2 makes for some interesting racing. Yeah, tip of the hat to Lou Gelati, uh, the veteran campaigner out of the Texas region. As we say, only his fifth runoff start. And uh, the last time uh, he ran, uh, his best finish so far was all the way back in 1975. Say, fifth runoff start, you make him sound like he doesn't have any uh, racing experience. But yeah. That guy has probably got a, 
more racing experience than uh, most of the people here on site. Yeah, yeah, most of, most of the people combined, I would think, absolutely. We do have a couple drivers that are Super Sweet eligible, as we mentioned. Tim Kesman, if he's able to hang on and win it, can win the Super Sweep yeah. outright. There's a uh, shot of Lou right there. Yep, there's Lou. In that Corvette with the traditional flame paint job on his race cars, a three-time world challenge winner back in the 90s. This guy has done it all. Absolutely. The other driver is uh, uh, Scotty B. White in the Zero Viper, but uh, he needs some help. Tim Kesman would have to finish 19th or below for Scotty B. to be able to notch the super sweep. I don't think Kesman's thinking about helping Scotty B. at this point. As uh, Kesman's leading the field here and looks so strong right off the start, that Porsche just plants the back end and it goes. And you think, well, it's just the car. Well, he's got a sister car, and Mark Bowden, who's also got a couple of gold medals to his name, and Kesman just was kind of out driving. The, the front other two there on yep. the opening couple laps before we went yellow. So Kez been very strong, able to find where the dry spots are in the track, and the car looked secure. The car didn't have a twitch. Bowden under braking a couple times, had some lockup in the front, which obviously Porsches tend to do. Uh, but Kesman didn't have any of that. He looked very stable under braking, and it was clear that uh, he's controlling this race. Yeah, both Tim and Mark uh, Bowden, of course, uh, under the, uh, the Fall Line Motorsports banner. And uh, as you mentioned, uh, uh, Mark Bowden, the... Uh, the major domo at uh, fall line but uh, obviously no team orders uh, he w just wants to see a fall line sure. car at the front if tim has got a little better handle on the conditions he's happy to let it happen yeah, absolutely and you see scotty b white a little deeper in the pack than i think he expected to be at this early stage as uh, he's back in ninth position right now thomas herb right in front of him in another of the porsches a pair of Corvettes, Jorge Nazario and Justin Oaks. Shot of, uh, Tiger Tom Patton right there in the number 50, as well as the, the 21 Tiger of Andrew Wright. You see, they, they don't have a windshield in front of them. They don't have a roof over their heads. They don't have to worry about fogging up the windshield or needing wipers. Their issue is going to be a little bit closer to home on that visor to make sure it stays closed and, and clear. And I say closed because as that spray comes up, it goes right into your visor and gets up into your eyes. So you got to be real careful in an open top car that way. Yeah, the tin top drivers have the option to crack that visor a little bit and get a little uh, ventilation under it to keep it clear. But uh, the open wheel drivers, not so much. Or the open cockpit drivers, yeah. I should say. Not so look much. at that Monte Carlo. He doesn't have any wiper either, but he does have a windshield. He's got a piece of Lexan in front of him. But right now, that thing's probably, you can see him. Hopefully a heavy dose of some sort of rain repellent before he went out on track today. We have seen drivers uh, in some of these cars with all sorts of uh, paraphernalia inside the cockpit, a stick with a with a with a, uh, a mop <laughs> on it as they get onto the straightaway and they'll reach out with their off hand and try to yeah, I don't get think the he's fog off the windshield. Yeah, switch on his uh, <laughs> AC there inside of his Monte Carlo where he can blast yeah, any kind of air across. Yeah, exactly. In your streetcar, you can flip the AC on and the fog disappears. But there's Boyd Lear out of Garden City, Kansas, one of our rookies in the field three rookies took taking the start boyd the highest placed of them right now base car is off we are about to go racing once again plenty of time left over half of this race time wise 22 minutes remain on the countdown clock so tim kesman is going to bring the field around andrew aquilante right behind him doing a fantastic job staying right between those two porsches who again by all things considered, probably better suited to these conditions. But there's a reason that Andrew Aquilani has 10 national championship gold medals. As Tim Kesman gets away at the front, as you would expect, as a little better traction. Mark Bowden doing a little better job of staying with these two. This time, Kesman right in the middle of the racetrack, hunting for places where the water isn't. Yeah, he's trying, where Aquilani takes more traditional wide entry there. But he was staying in the spray down the front straight away, maybe trying to catch a little draft. I would think you'd need that in the Corvette. But Bowden stayed on the clean side of the track so he could at least see what's going on in front of him, find his breaking point. As we flash back here to the battle of fourth, Jonathan Stark and Lou Gelati, the Viper in the Corvette. Gelati doing a fantastic job as uh, he is right up on the back of Jonathan Stark. Oh, and little, here we go. Look at from Kesman. Yeah, and Aqualani right on his tail. In fact, he's going to try to take the long way around turn six, and that will be a, a place with uh, maybe a little better traction. He's going to do the over-under and try to go around the outside at 6A onto the Holman straight. But Kesman able to maintain the advantage. This is right the place where... Uh, Joe Koenig ran into a big puddle of water and the car the turned left on him. And here comes Aqualande thinking about trying to outbreak him down into turn number seven, but uh, has to fall back in single file. Tim yeah. Kesman continuing to show the way. The left side of the track down home of straight did look like it's a little bit uh, darker shade, so a little bit uh, less water over there. I think that's what Aqualante was trying to shoot for, but for Kesman able to get the brakes. But Aqualante now had a great run off of 10. 
Yeah, right the, into the, into 10. They're going to split the slower car. No, they're not. As uh, Tim Kesman had to uh, to uh, juke to uh, move the la remove the lapper from his uh, field of view, and that has put Ac Andrew Aquilante to the front as our pole sitter and 10-time gold medal winner has hit hit the front here with about 20 minutes raining, uh, remaining. Kesman tries to cut the uh, the angle down through uh, turn number 12. Now they're heading through 14 and coming up onto the banking one more time. Huge opportunistic move there for Aquilante as he goes through to 10. Had a really good line with the traffic out in front of him. Kind of used him as a bit of a pick. He really did push Kesman all the way over to him to make sure that he got the better run. It seemed to work for him. I'm not sure how long it's going to last, though. We know how fast Kesman can be. The question now is under braking, going into what, a full song. How well and how smooth can they do this without much lockup? Hesman coming up onto the front straightaway, got right out against the wall as that car, I'm sure, is skating on a film of water as they go through that big puddle right at the exit of turn one into turn two and three they go now. The sweeping long turn number four that leads down into what we like to call the skid pad, that long constant radius turn number six as they head through turn five down into that area right now. Visibility has just got to be terrible. You see Kesman, he kind of flashes to the side to try to get some visibility. You can see a breaking point. You get two different lines here through this corner, but every time he has to go full line to stern, he's just stuck in the spray coming off that big Corvette. Yeah, so he'll juke out to the side just to get a little better visibility, if nothing else, as they come on to the Holman Straight, a treacherous Holman Straight, we might say. You would think, hey, it's just a straight piece of asphalt, but there's a lot of standing water down there that can catch him out. Kesman got a great run off 6A, and he's back down to the inside. He's going to try to retake the lead, and he spins it. Goes sideways, does Tim Kesman. Andrew Aquilande able to get around the outside. Kesman may have killed the motor as he is trying to get it re going, restarted again. I'm really surprised Mark Bowden isn't a little closer to this yeah, to take over second. Yeah, it's about a 12 second. second gap from where these two were to where Bowden was when they last crossed the stripe. Bowden really struggling out there. So that's allowing Kesley to hold position. And one thing to know, you look at that timer now, down to under 18, or just about 18 minutes left in this thing. We need to stay clean and green all the way through because anything that comes out in yellow could potentially end the race early. So holding position now is, is just crucial. And for Aquilante, now he's got that position at probably about a 10 second lead. Here's a replay. It looked like Kesman was in the driver's seat as he comes down to the inside of turn number seven. Appeared to have it all going his way, but hit a puddle just at the wrong spot, and the rear end stepped out on him. And one of the uh, disadvantages of the rear engine Porsche, once you get behind it, it's pretty much going to go around. Yeah, and you know, you look as you come down there again, left side of the track looks nice and a little cleaner, a little drier, but as you say, big puddles right at the break and right at the turn in point there, going into turn seven. I wonder if Aquilante saw that at the previous lap and this time decided to push Kesman over there to make sure that it was Kesman to hit that giant puddle and not and not our leader, Aquilante. There's your third place runner, Mark Bowden. As he comes up onto the front straightaway and across the line. Again, well back of his teammate, Tim Kesman, in the 144 car in second spot. Bowden, a multiple national champion, four-time national champion, most recently winning T2 up at Road America a year ago. We talked about Acalante's uh, 10 gold medals. Mark Bowden has 17 medals, 17 times he's been on the podium at the runoffs. And that's actually more right now than Aquilante has. So yeah, Bozeman's got a, uh, Bowden excuse me, has got a lot of experience at the runoffs, I'm sure a lot of experience in Porsches in the wet, right now running in third with his teammate, his buddy, Mr. Kesman, out in front of him. Of all the drivers competing here, uh, uh, Andrew Aquilani holds the record for the most poles. He's got 16 poles in the multiple classes that he's contending with. So clearly Aquilante has the speed in the wet and in the dry. As uh, again, if, if you had taken book before this race started, that Andrew Aquilani in that high horsepower, big tired Corvette would be able to uh, put a whooping on these two Porsches. He is doing the job right now. And uh, another spinner there is the six car goes around. That's Thomas Erb out of Barrington, Illinois. One of the other fall line Porsches. Exactly, as he loops it right there at turn number 12. That's right by the uh, pit entrance as, as we're going to see him coming. Yeah, he had, he had already lost it as he exited 12 coming into 13 and uh, just got it sideways. Two wheels off in the grass, but I think he'll be able to get restarted. Although he's Hasn't still sitting yet. there, yeah. As traffic comes, he's... He's, he's trying not to pull into the gravel is what he's doing. He doesn't want to back up into the racing line, but at the same time, he doesn't want to be in the gravel, so he's doing this bit of a, a long-winded K-turn to get himself out of there. Exactly, and that's going to allow a couple cars to get by, including Tom Patton in the number 50 Sunbeam Tiger. Tom currently running in the 10th spot. 
So Thomas Erb uh, spinning out of seventh. Scotty B. White now up into eighth spot. It'll be seventh as he comes across the line. So just to show you the speed that they still have, Andrew Aquilante is just around 140 miles an hour on the front straight in these conditions. Actually, one of his laps he did 142 last time, just a, just a touch under 140. That is crazy speed in these conditions. With the walls going by you and all the puddles unknown every time you come into the corner. Is it going to be more rain the last time or not? Aquilante, all kinds of guts right now, just pushing it, trying to win this race. Exactly right. Tim Kesman just set his personal best, a 205.099 for Kesman to a 206.034. So he's about a second faster, but unfortunately that spin has cost him 12 seconds of time. So uh, he's probably not going to have enough laps to make it up if that's the way the interval stays. 12 seconds, 14 minutes. So yeah, he's got to be picking up about a second or so, probably close to a second a lap more like three seconds a lap to catch up to Aquilante. As you can see him there working his way around Andrew Wright in the other of our Sunbeam Tigers. There's not a lot of sun right now on a Sunbeam. <laughs> exactly. It's Kesman. Kesman is lapping faster. He was about a second faster than Aquilante last time across. So again, 12 seconds in 12 minutes. He's, I guess it's got to be about two seconds a lap faster to probably catch Andrew. But you just watch Andrew, he is really working that car. Look at that big slide drift, counter steer, coming off of the bank in there through 12, throws it into 13. You can see the back end will kind of squirt a little bit as he puts power, and he's hunting for dry pavement here to get the power down. And there's a couple of just patches of it. The closer you get to the higher outside of the oval, the higher it gets. So that's good for Andrew to try and find some dry pavement to get the grip so he can hit the 140 down the front straight. Sunoco, of course, the official fuel of the SCCA, also sponsors the Sunoco Hard Charger Award for the driver who makes up the most positions from their qualifying position to their finished race position. We've got a couple of our drivers, Boyd Lear, in the, that Chevy Monte Carlo, looked like he might be one of the ones to consider, but it uh, looks like he made it into the pits, so that's not going to be his uh, opportunity, but I'm guessing that Jorge Nazario in the uh, number 165 Corvette will certainly be a front runner uh, out of San Juan, Puerto Rico. Um, what if you've seen a little bit of rain down in San Juan? Uh, well, he's certainly some seen some hurricanes down there yeah. for sure. And there's Lou Gelati having uh, taken over that spot from Jonathan Stark. Big Lou doing a fantastic job up into four spot. He's just one spot out of the medals and only his fifth runoff start in a storied career in, in uh, both pro and amateur racing. So Jonathan Stark shuffled back to fifth. Good Gelati taking over that spot. And Stark once again right up against the wall as he comes off turn 14 up onto the front straightaway. I bet for Gelati all the experience he has, all the wins and all the different things he's driven in and driven as cars, still coming to the runoffs and trying to push and coming to Indianapolis at the runoffs is probably still a bucket list for him like it is for a lot of our competitors here. So it's really kind of cool, that enthusiasm, even somebody who's uh, kind of got the experience. I don't want to say how old he is, but he's definitely experienced. Oh, that's our leader, Andrew Aquilante. And he has spun it right there at turn eight, it looks like. So Andrew Aquilante, he didn't lose nearly as much time as Tim Kesman, but this is going to give Kesman some new life here as he's working his way there through turn number 10. I'm sure Kesman's team's on the radio with him right now saying, hey, you got to go. You're 11 minutes left, and your leader out in front of you just spun. You've got opportunity here. This could cut the lead probably in half. Yeah, and it's going to cut uh, Aqualante's uh, feeling in the car just a little bit. It's got to shake his confidence just a touch after having had that spin, thinking that he pretty much had this wet track under control. I don't want to say you're wrong, but I've met Andrew. I'm not sure you can shake his confidence. He's a very <laughs> confident young man. If you've ever met Oh, yeah, Andrew, I have many times. Yes, he, he's very confident. But he can now see, if he looks through his mirrors, he can see that white Porsche coming up behind him. And at least, if nothing else, it's going to make him refocus. That's tough to do to shake that after a spin like that when you're leading, and all of a sudden you've got to hit the next mark and the next mark and the next mark. Not easy to do in these conditions, but I think they really are changing as the rain slows a little, picks up a little. It changes almost every single corner every time by. Kesman has cut the lead in half with that bobble by Andrew Aquilante. It's down to five seconds, and that is definitely doable with 10 minutes still remaining in this race, almost 11 minutes. So we'll see as we look at Kesman's lap time, that last lap not really uh, significant because it includes Aquilante's spin but we'll get a replay of that bobble by Andrew Aquilante as he's coming into turn number seven. That's right where Kesman spun. And 
and uh, into turn eight, I think, yep. and right there is where he lost it. And back end just started to go, and again, there's puddles forming all over the place, and these guys have been trying to stay off of the curbs because a lot of rubber down there, and he was trying, but I'm not sure he was as wide as where we saw Kesman trying to take that line earlier. Yep. I think he may have just got a little bit of the slipperiness of the polished pavement underneath. So here comes our leader, Andrew Aqualante, just putting a lap on Tom Patton, the ninth place runner. So only eight cars remain on the lead lap, and those headlights in the in the fog in the background are Tim Kesman running in second. Like I say, across the line, he was uh, within five seconds of Andrew Aqualante. Steve Andrews changes his line a little bit. Still going tight, still using the, the curbs around that apex here through the S's. Maybe on the brakes there leading into turn number 10. Okay. All your all your inputs, your steering inputs, your braking inputs, your throttle uh, inputs, all have to be just so ginger in these kind of conditions. You just have to really take it easy. Lou Gelati putting a lap on somebody as he is still staying at the fourth spot. I'm watching the uh, the deltas. we got a good shot of Gelati here showing his veteran experience in the rain. Just watching the delta of sector times with Yanaka Volante and Desmond. It's going to take another two seconds out of this lap, the way these two are going, so we'll get to them in a minute. But you got Gelati here in the Corvette, of course, and I think that it's Jonathan Start yep. right behind him in the Viper. As Gelati got past Jonathan earlier, but Jonathan didn't seem to have gone anywhere as they're going to use the apron. Hope they know there's a puddle down there at turn in right before the apex here at seven. Yeah, here they come into that uh, area that caught Tim Kesman out. Big splash, as you can see. They both managed to negotiate it, so Gelati holding on to his advantage. This is the battle for fourth spot between Lee Gelati in the Corvette. Jonathan Stark in the Viper. Look at the, the time difference between Kesman and uh, Aqualati on that last lap. Kesman almost four seconds faster. He's cut the lead down to one second, and here it is. That lead evaporated in a hurry. It evaporated faster than any of this water is going to evaporate. <laughs> Look at the pressure now on, on the defending champ, the two-time defending champ. Yep, Aqualante taking it around that endless turn number six through 6A and onto the Holman straight. Tim Kesman right on his back bumper. Andrew trying everything to get the power down. Any just little touch of that throttle pedal and that car wants to step out. Here's a replay almost of what happened when Kesman spun, but this time he tries to clear Andrew and he's gonna be a little wide of that puddle, I think. Oh, it just uh, kind of went through it as well, but this time he learned his lesson to not be turning while doing it. He got his braking done, kept the wheel straight before he actually turned in. We've got a new leader. Tim Kesman retakes the lead that he gave up right there at turn seven a few laps ago. Now negotiating turn number 10. Kesman being very ginger as well. They're coming they up and that's Boyd Lear in one of our Monte Carlos. They're gonna go past and right in front of them is gonna be Jorge Nazario in the 165 Corvette. I'm sure he can see them coming. Maybe there's spray behind him. I'm not sure how much he can see. Now Nazario turning in right in front of our leaders. And he's staying right on his line, which is what he should do and allow these guys to pick their way through. As Kesman got the better of that exchange for sure, as he had now taken it through a very wet, look at the water being thrown up by these rain tires as he comes onto the front straightaway. And again, a really dicey moment every lap as he drifts right up alongside the wall. With seven minutes remaining, Tim Kesman taking the lead, setting the fast lap of the race at a 2.03, 5.13, four seconds quicker than Andrew Aqualante. So he has gone from a one second deficit to a three and a half second lead in the closing stages of this race with about six and a half minutes remaining. That's like three laps worth. That's just amazing, but it's not over yet. Again, Absolutely. You can, you, can just, you can never say it's over in a race like this, but look at the line he's taking, not taking the wide entry, doing the slow in, fast out. When you've got the power right over those uh, rear wheels, all that weight right over the rear wheels on one of these Porsches, that's how you got to drive it. Just get the thing turned and shoot in the right way and uh, squirt on out of there. Even around the skid pad of six here, staying completely away from any sort of rubber and oil that might be down along that apex that's been raced on for the last five or six days. He's going to be looking for some clean pavement as he comes up in the back. I think that's Scotty White. Yeah, Scotty B. White, I believe, is in about to go a lap down. He is seventh, so that would only leave six drivers on the lead lap. And Andrew Aquilani back there in a distant second spot now, pretty much throwing up his hands and saying, no mas, I think he doesn't want any part of this. His best hope is that Kesman gets a little overconfident or trips over a back marker. Kesman, and, uh, you know, obviously here, it's nothing that uh, Scotty can do through those S's other than just hold his line. And he's gonna try and leave room for, for Kesman. 
But Kesma may have lost a little momentum. Aquilante could still be back there. Working his way through turn 13, or turn 11, excuse me, up onto the banking. And this is a, a very tricky turn in the dry as the track falls away. There's no help from the camber there as they come down off the banking into this little switchback at turn 12 and 13. But then splashing his way. He's, he's about to put a big old spray right in Andrew Wright's face as they go down this front straightaway. Andrew Wright's going to be wiping his visor here in a second. Yeah, and uh, that's a, a second lap down for Andrew Wright, running in 12th position right now. That's Tim Kesman across the line, four and a half minutes remaining. And a huge lead now. He has really stretched his advantage. He's uh, clearly making up, making amends for that spin he had back at mid-race, which cost him the lead. Well, this little buffer now that he has back to Aquilante has allowed him the, the, the luxury to be able to kind of wait and really hunt for puddles and hunt for dry. And uh, I think he'll be taking, you kind of see a little bit of a glare coming out there. I'm wondering if the clouds are starting to dissipate a little bit. It is still raining, but you can see it just kind of got a little bit brighter out here. And uh, I wonder if that's a sign that the rain might actually be slowing up a bit. It's not going to be slowing enough for any of the drivers in our field that weather's going to help them. It's still going to rain all the way through. And let's not forget Mark Bowden running in the third spot as he is down in turn number one right now. Camera angles a little different in the wet as our camera is having to adapt to the wet weather conditions. Fine job from our Apex crew. These images are just dynamite, keeping us right up to speed with all of the action as Mark Bowden soldiering on in third. I think he's uh, going to be content with that medal. Like you said, he's got such a big collection of them. He's content with that, and right now he's probably ecstatic that his buddy and, and uh, part of his team, Tim Kesman, is leading this race with about three minutes to go, probably two more laps for Kesman, depending on where he is when he crosses start-finish. And for Kesman, that clock can't tick fast enough. Yeah. The last thing in these conditions you want to do is to have to run an extra lap. <laughs> exactly. So Kesman might be thinking, hey, if I slow down a little bit, I might be able to get the white this time by. Maybe. <laughs> but no, he's too close to it. With three minutes left, he's going to get across the line. So it'll be two more laps, I would guess. Yeah, okay. he's right now going through 13. Just the gap now. right now is probably close to about 10 seconds, maybe even longer as he's probably going to be longer, probably more like 14 seconds as he was five seconds faster in the first sector than Andrew Aquilante. Kesman is just putting on a clinic right now on rain driving. And I want to get at home and you want to learn how to drive in the rain. Just watch Kesman's race. Exactly right. But I want to give another tip of the hat to Andrew Rockwell. He is a minute, over a minute, in front of Mark Bowden, who's a very experienced uh, driver. And Bowden, who was licking his chops at the beginning of this race as uh, as Hayward was talking to him. And uh, that's a fantastic run by Andrew Aguilani, no doubt about it, to put that much gap on uh, uh, an experienced driver like Mark Bowden. That's saying something. It really is. It says a lot about all three of these guys right now in these provisional podium spots. They are just uh, cream of the crop when it comes to drivers. Andrew's doing a fantastic job. Bowden is a benchmark any class he jumps into. Yep. And for Kesman right now, just putting on an absolute clinic on top of both of those veteran champions. So tip of the hat to uh, the Phoenix team for for preparing this car beautifully. Like you said, it's a two-time defending champion. Yeah, I tell you what, that's, that, although it is a Phoenix team, that is really Andrew's baby. When I oh, talked yeah. to him in 2019, and he had just rolled this thing out of the trailer for the first time when they got to VIR. He built this thing himself. He, yep. went, to, he went to Joe, father, and team owner, and said, hey, I want to do this. And Andrew took it upon himself. He does all his own wrenching on his own car. Yep. He's not any sort of driver prima donna. He is as grease monkey as anybody gets. Uh, but he also, when he puts a helmet on, is just one of the best behind the wheel. So we get a good look at this battle a little deeper in the back. That's the 11 of Justin Oaks, who's currently running in the sixth spot, and Scotty B. White right behind him. So this is the, the, the two ends of the spectrum here in terms of experience in the wet. We had heard Justin Oaks never ran the wet before, and of course, Scotty B. White runs a lot of wet up in the Pacific Northwest, and here they are coming to the end of the race together. Actually, that is not Scotty B. White. That's Jonathan Stark, oh, who was in fifth, and Oaks has just taken over uh, that fifth spot. So thanks to our uh, director for catching that uh, pass for a position. So Justin Oaks up into fifth, putting Jonathan Start back in sixth position. As here comes Tim Kesman, he will see the white flag this time by as he drifts right up alongside that wall. The white flag is in the air. He only needs to negotiate this 2.6 mile thing at speed at least yep. one more time. 14 more corners, gotta hit the brakes probably about six more times. <laughs> 
That's where it's critical, is under breaking here. And you can see him just coming down off of the bank and kind of as late as he can to enter into the, the puddle spectrum there of turns one and two. Just doing a great job. And right now, he, you don't want to back off. Your eyes are just focusing on where are the drier spots? Where's the darker pavement where I don't see the shine? Look at him going through four, just all the way down to the inside entry there. But that's where it's driest. That's the line he's going to choose. And it's hard to believe, but this, if he's able to hang on for another half a dozen corners, this will be the first gold medal for Tim Kesman. He has got uh, uh, what, just one medal. He finished third at VIR in this class. So believe it or not, this will be Tim Kesman's first gold medal. He is going to be a happy camper. And to make it, a, uh, to make it even that much sweeter, he's going to clinch the super sweep as well. His seventh runoff start. Keep an eye there. you got Thujalati now. Running around, I want to see how close he is getting actually to Mark Bowden. Actually, that's Justin Oaks, and that's for Oaks. position. Oaks is right behind Lou Gelati now, and that's for position. That's yeah. for fourth. So the driver that came out with no rain experience now out dueling the, the KG veteran who's got all the experience here in this wet conditions. Oaks apparently likes the rain. Yeah, and uh, does quite well in it, I might add. As that pair of Corvettes, you would think pretty evenly matched. Oaks definitely getting the job done, picking up a couple spots here in as many laps as we're in the closing stages here. As Justin Oaks comes up onto the front straightaway. Now I wonder how far behind behind Mark Bowden is Justin Oaks. Yeah, because Gelati was only about 10 seconds behind him. But nonetheless, let's turn our attention to our champion elect as the 144 of Tim Kesman working his way up onto the front straight away for the final time. The checkered flag is in the air, ladies and gentlemen. A dominant performance. Danny Sullivan had a spin and win here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Tim Kesman just did the same. Fantastic drive for him. Just uh, wonderful to see how fast a car can be thrown around here in these conditions, as well as Andrew Aquilante. Another great drive for him. Probably not, uh, maybe not the right tool for the job today, but he showed how. how how really skilled he can be behind the wheel of anything in any conditions. Absolutely, as he kind of tiptoes his way through this final turn. Well adrift of our winner, Tim Kesman, but Andrew Roccolani can hold his head high. That is a fantastic drive, like you said, in a car that probably wasn't the tool for the conditions. Uh, he is just <laughs> ruining the fact that this rain came about an hour too early for him. Yeah because he easily could have made it three in a row. Yes, the, the battle for four, or battle for the last podium spot is not decided yet. We know it was Bowden when they came across for white flag, but we know Justin Oaks is one of the fastest cars on the track right now. And, and he's there's got your it. answer. Justin Oaks is gonna, gonna snatch a medal away from Mark Bowden here in the closing stages unless Bowden can get back by him. It's not decided yet for sure. No. That Porsche is gonna try and plant the gas. We might have a fight going into 12 here on this last lap. What a great battle for the final step on the podium, the bronze medal between these two drivers as Justin Oaks certainly will be a factor. He started in third spot. Looks like he's gonna try to finish in third after falling well back. As we can see Andrew right there in front of him. Bowden dives down to the inside at turn 12. Can't close the deal. Coming on to the front straightaway. Oaks getting a little squirrely. You can see that car trying to give up. Bowden should have better traction in the run to the line. They've got a back marker in front of them right out to the wall they come. Here comes Oaks, another slower car. Oaks is going to hold him off and take that medal by the slimmest of margins. Mark Bowden has to settle for fourth position. Uh, just about a quarter of a second at the line. Oh, my goodness. It's the most, ex ex most exciting boat race I've seen all week. <laughs> exactly. What a great drive for Justin Oaks, picking up three spots literally in the closing couple of laps <laughs> for a driver who has no rain experience. It took him probably about 13 laps to get used to the rain. Those last four for him were just flyers and able to pull up and end up on the podium with Tim Kesman and Andrew Aquilante. Great drive from all three, but Justin Oaks. That was awesome. Yeah, in these conditions, would you have expected two Corvettes on the podium? I would say no. And uh, what a fantastic job by both Andrew Aquilani and Justin Oaks breaking through for the silver and bronze medals in these really dire conditions. <laughs> and uh, doing a fantastic job of uh, keeping his nose clean and getting the job done. It is definitely damp out there. Very happy to not be standing out in it, but I know one of our members of our crew is standing out there waiting for this guy to get down there along his pit lane. He's out there waving to the rest of the fall line crew along the wall. 
as he gets to go all the way to the front of the line. You can see Kesman with the door open, probably trying to clear the windows a little <laughs> bit as he pulls under the rain canopy there. Yeah, these cup cars don't exactly have roll-down windows. Yeah, exactly right. The Lemons of Love sponsorship right on the hood great. of that car. Yeah, great project there, the Lemons of Love. Yep. Andrew Aquilante coming down the pit lane. A valiant drive to second spot, getting thumbs up from all the grid marshals. They know what a great job Andrew did. Not so sure how happy he's going to be. I mean, coming home and keeping that car on pavement and getting on the, the silver medal here is, is a huge accomplishment. Uh, but, you know, Andrew's got always the highest standards for himself. And uh, But I'm hoping he's at least content with his performance to be able to come home in that position in that car. Hayward Wagner down in a very wet pit lane, talking to our winner, Tim Kesman. Tim, I'm just gonna ask you straight, how are your nerves? <laughs> you know, this one's a long time coming. I mean, uh, I didn't want the rain. Traditionally, I'm always better in the dry. Mark Bowden, he's the man in the rain, you know? But uh, whatever happened, happened, and it was good, I mean, we. We raced hard with Mark on the first lap and got him there. And then uh, Andrew and I swapped a couple of times. I lost, he spun, I spun. How hard was it for you to kind of regain comfort and confidence after the spin? It was, it was, it was tough. There's a, a lot of standing, a lot of standing water out there all over. So even when you wouldn't think, you know, that you were, that you were in peril, uh, you know, you run into a big old lake and the car would just get light and slide around, so. Well, congratulations, this is your second medal, your first win here at the runoffs at Indy. Congratulations to you. You gonna take a victory lap or park it? No, no, I think uh, I gotta see if the guys wanna go. I mean, uh, is there anybody around? Uh, <laughs> I did ask him. I guess we're gonna park it. All right, there's your winner. Tim Kesman doing a very frank assessment of the conditions out there. He uh, looks exhausted. Yeah. I mean, that, that was a lot of work to keep that car just played it. It's a lot of focus, a lot of attention, a lot of muscle work to keep that thing constantly pointing the right direction because that light front end and those Porsches don't always want to turn, especially when you get a, a stream of water underneath. So that is a ton of work for him. Well-deserved gold medal for him. Absolutely, yeah. The recovery after his spin, really, yeah. uh, really uh, one of the best I've seen and uh, a great job for uh, Tim Kesman. But uh, the man who's probably the most disappointed man on the property, Andrew Aquilante, again, with the conditions, he's certainly got to hold his head high, finishing within 39 seconds yeah. of Tim Kesman at the end of this race uh, after a spin of his own. But uh, there uh, in the middle stages, it certainly looked like Andrew uh, might uh, have a chance to uh, surprise everybody and take uh, the top step on the podium. But wasn't to be. And Justin Oaks, really the drive of the day for me uh, in that number yeah. 11 car. Obviously, Justin He's fell. He's going to be ecstatic. He fell well back at, yeah. at the beginning and then just charged his way to the front. Uh, those last three laps were just amazing. We uh, All of a sudden, he was next to Gelati. He said, where did he come from? And then all of a sudden, hey, you know, it's not over yet. Bowden was there for the, the taking. And. Yeah, and again, just finish ahead of Mark Bowden, as, as Tim Kesman just said, Bowden is usually the master of the rain. Uh, not Bar not Mark Bowden's day but for Justin Oaks, able to come through. The first time seeing rain under his race tires, he made the most out of it, finishing up here at the podium. It looks like Tim is going to take that victory lap after all. Hey, we're trying to see if we can get the other two. Sounds like we've got our second place finisher, Andrew Aquilani with Hayward. You jinxed me. <laughs> Andrew's accusing me of jinxing him. I said you'd be third. I didn't say second. This is on me. No. This is on me. Talk. To, you, you got a big grin on your face. How was that race for you just from the joy of driving? Were you having fun? Was it miserable? Or your nerves shot? Like, what, what does it feel like? I think I broke my elbow, and I and I am, I'm torched at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> no, I was <sighs> wild. Tell me about the spin. Well, oh, just... There was no grip. I mean, that was the thing. I mean, Tim did it when we went charging down in there, what, four laps earlier? And I did it a little bit farther. I mean, that, uh, the track was inundated. I mean, that was, at one point during that caution, I was considering coming in. Um, from the aspect of that first lap, Mark, Tim, and I almost all balled it up about 10 times, it felt like. But, you know, once, I'm like, okay, we'll, we'll run the restart here and, uh, and I had a jump on Tim and got by him. Then he spun, and I'm like, okay, we'll we'll hang out here and we'll do what we can. And then he caught us, and you know that's that's that. I mean, we were part, we were part throttle, other than on the front straightaway everywhere, so we couldn't do much. So did you learn anything you used maybe later this weekend? 
Oh, ah. yeah, hopefully it doesn't rain. You know, it's, it's that sort of thing that uh, this place was pretty nasty in the wet. And, you know, the reason why I hung out there was because I'm like, okay, well, all these workers, all the people out here, they're here, they're out there flagging still. So we'll, we'll keep it up as long as we can. And he gets by us, he gets by us. Once he got by us, I'm like, I ain't risking it for this. You know, there's no biscuit, so I ain't risking it. Um, so they told me third was a minute back. I'm like, okay, he can have it. Well, it was a heck of a show. It was a lot of fun to watch. Congratulations on the silver. Thank you. We're going to get Justin next. Justin? Yes. Justin. <laughs> Justin told us on grid that uh, never raced in the rain before. It yeah. looks like it took you about 13 laps to figure out how to do it. I, that sounds about right. Um, I'm extremely happy. I mean, we were able to get on the podium or get third on the last lap barely. My team didn't tell me what position I was in. So for me, it was just overwhelming. I mean, I couldn't see anything down the straight. I've never raced in the rain. I've never been on rain tire on any car, not just this one. So this was a lot. So the fact that we came away uh, with a good result, make my team proud, and with my wife here and my family and everybody, it's just like huge achievement, my first runoff. So very happy. We don't have driver of the day voting in this event, but if we did, I feel like you probably locked that one in. Congratulations. Thank you very much. I really appreciate all you guys do. Thank you. I second that. Justin Oaks, drive of the day for sure, uh, figuring it out at the end uh, when it counted and uh, bringing that car home into third spot. What a fantastic drive. Oh, absolutely. And you could just you could see the, the, the joy and elation on his, in his voice as he's saying that and also about you know, thanking his team and, uh, and his wife, of course. Is there, these things don't happen without a team or without your family. Yeah, I, it was amazing to me that he wasn't sure whether Andrew won or not So because <laughs> he asked the question, did you win? So, I mean, clearly his team did keep him in the dark. Here's the top ten finishers. Only six cars finished on the lead lap. Tim Kesman, your winner. Andrew Aqualante in second. Justin Oaks, drive of the day, in third, albeit over a minute behind the second-place finisher. Mark Bowden came home in fourth. Lou Gelati, a great drive for the veteran, into fifth. Jonathan Start hung on for a sixth-place finish. First car a lap down, Thomas Erb in the sixth. Jorge Nazario out of Puerto Rico comes home in eighth. Scotty B. White and Tiger Tom Patton gets another top ten in the Sunbeam Tiger. So the highlights or rain lights of this one, Mark Bowden looks like he was uh, off to the races at the beginning, but look at that white Porsche right behind him as his teammate Tim Kesman closing the gap quickly as they head down into turn number one on the opening lap as a lot of cars really tiptoeing down that front straightaway. But uh, Tim Kesman not only survived the race, but survived his victory lap and has got it right there in front of the podium. Yeah, what a fight, though, really, between he and Aqualante for a couple laps there. Had a great fight, and then, of course, his spin, you know, it would have been, it really almost for a moment there thought maybe he cost the race and handed it over to Andrew Aqualante, and Andrew just kept pushing and pushing until he had his spin. Uh, for Kesman, though, man, look at the pace that he has to be able to win this race by almost 40 seconds over a 10-time champ. That's impressive. We're going to take another shot at our highlights. As uh, just We apologize for just a little technical glitch, but, uh, you know, the rain gets into the uh, <laughs> production equipment again. Here we go, running our way down the front straightaway. Mark Bowden at the point, but here was a scary moment as Joe Koenig aquaplaning down the Holman straightaway, and that car just turned sharply left into the guardrail. But Shows fortunately, you how wet it really was for these guys. Yeah, Joe out of the car walking. That's a good sign to see. But then on the restart, Andrew Aqualante, considering the conditions and considering maybe not the best tool for the race, able to stay right with uh, uh, Tim Kesman. Kesman with an unforced error, spinning it down at turn seven, gave the lead to Aqualante. And just as it looked like uh, Andrew was going to be able to drive away into the sunset, Tim Kesman uh, put the visor down, got a little bit of the red mist, I'm sure, and uh, not only caught him, but passed him. The uh, and uh, stretched his lead out to a 40 second advantage at the yeah. end. Tremendous finish, way, way to really close that race out and win that gold medal. So with that, we will say a uh, rather soggy adieu to the GT2 National Final. And once again, thanks to our friends from Mazda for their sponsorship of the broadcast of the 58th running of the SCCA National Championship runoffs. For Lefty McLeod and Hayward Wagner, I'm John Fippen. Thanks for being with us. We'll see you down the road. Welcome to that magic realm. Between here and there, a no man's land in everyone's land where great expectations grow and rewards are given to the swift, the perceptive, and the daring.
Introducing the Mazda CX-30 Turbo with all-wheel drive. More power for your pursuit.